Amen. Zechariah chapter 13, this is a very um, interesting chapter. There's some fascinating prophecy about Jesus. We know He's the living water, and it starts off by talking about that fountain that's open for sin. It goes on and talks about the wounds in His hands. But if you would, look at verse number 7, also speaking of Jesus. Zechariah 13, verse 7, it says, Awake, O sword, against my shepherd, and against the man that is my fellow, saith the Lord of hosts. Smite the shepherd, and the sheep shall be scattered, and I will turn my hand upon the little ones. This fascinating statement here, it's obviously talking about the Lord Jesus Christ when He was attacked, when He was killed, and as a leader, once He was gone off the scene, the disciples fled and they were scattered. There's a deeper meaning here, and this is one of those truths of the universe, a law, if you will, that God has instituted, that if there's a uh, shepherd over some sheep, and you smite the shepherd that he's down or gone, the sheep will scatter. They'll go everyone unto their own way, right? And so this truth is known by us, but you know, the devil knows the Bible too, and he knows that if he can attack a father or attack a godly man, that he can eliminate that shepherd that's there as a safeguard and a protector and a leader. We live in a time where Satan is attacking biblical manhood. And that's what I want to talk about, because if you notice the end of this verse, I find it fascinating. Look at the last words it says, and I will turn my hand upon the little ones. If you haven't figured it out yet, Satan and his minions and this perverted world that we live in, they're after the children. They want the hearts and the minds and the lives and the souls of the children, and they know that they can't get close. It's interesting, uh, without revealing what we were talking about at lunch, somebody brought it up. We were talking, there's a couple things that came up at lunch, and I told them, I said, guys, you got to stop. You're preaching my sermon for me tonight. But one of them made the point uh, of, of abusers. They interviewed an abuser, and he said, well, if I found a family where it was a strong father figure, uh, I knew that I, 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 I couldn't get anywhere there. But I went where there was no man or a weak man that wouldn't stand up for his family, and that is who I attacked. That's who I went after. Isn't it interesting? Smite the father, if you will, and then Satan will go after the little ones to devour them. This is what's happening in America. It is by design. It is not an accident. There was a conspiracy, if you will. And I'm not talking about a conspiracy theory. I'm talking about that two or three gathered together in secret to devise hurt to someone else. That's what conspiracy means. Cons the word conspiracy is used in the Bible all throughout. And in Russia and uh, the territory surrounding that area, there was a plan for socialism and communism and atheism specifically. And they knew that if they could attack the family unit, that they could then raise up children. Uh, just as it was mentioned at lunch, how about the Hitler Youth? How was it they were able to get another generation that are ready and willing to just go out and die for a cause that ultimately means nothing. How they would lay their life down for the wrong reason. I tell you how. Smite the shepherd and then Satan can get the little ones. This satanic or socialist plan was well planned and well laid out. The Marxists dealt with it. They knew that they had to destroy the family unit. These doctrines have ultimately made their way to America. They had a problem in Russia where people stopped reproducing. They were paying people to separate and to divorce and to not reconcile, and so people stopped having children. And it's come to America where there are many people that live in very poor neighborhoods where they understand how to use the system. And to use the system, you either, uh, you know, you get on the, the dole, you get on the government, you know, it's either through one method or another. There's many government programs, and I don't want to delve into all that, but I want you to understand there are people that know how to manipulate the system to get free money. The problem with it is, is when you domesticate somebody, here's another word, uh, declaw. Declaw or defang. I don't believe in declawing or defanging cats, even if they're an indoor cat. Because if that cat gets outside, they cannot defend themselves against a dog. 
right? A predator comes at them, they're just, you know, with these soft little mittens that won't go anywhere, right? <laughs> yeah, I know, I know you might sacrifice a couch, but it'll save the cat's life ultimately, right? Well, that's what communism wants to do. It wants to defang you or declaw you. It wants to take away all the power you have to defend yourself. And so they knew that if they could attack the family unit, that they would be successful. This came to America in certain forms of welfare, where if a lady has a child, they get a check as long as the father does not live in the house. Do you understand how evil that is? The government will pay you to not reconcile with the father, to not let the father of the child be in the house. Well, who's going to lead? Well, we'll have strong moms. And hey, we love strong godly moms, but God's plan was strong biblical dads. Biblical masculinity. Biblical masculinity. How does Satan attack? Attack the man of the house, and the little ones will become prey. In Matthew 26, Jesus said, All ye shall be offended because of me this night, for it is written, I will smite the shepherd, and the sheep of the flock shall be scattered abroad. Jesus knew that that was speaking of him, and he gave that to them, and this truth is here for us. America is in trouble. Children have a problem because dads have not been biblical dads. And listen, I'm not standing up here saying, I've got it all figured out, and I'm the best dad in the world. I, I wish I could say that. I have a heart to try to become a better man. I have a heart to be a better biblicist. I want to be a better Christian. I want to be, be a better servant of the Lord, which I believe will make me a better leader in my own house. And this is the concept we have to get back to. Go to Psalm chapter 12, if you would. Go to Psalm chapter 12. In Mark chapter 3, Jesus said, No man can enter into a strong man's house and spoil his goods, except he will first bind the strong man, and then he will spoil his house. Somebody cannot break into your house until the house is defenseless, and to do that, if they can knock dad out, then they can go into the house and take whatever they want and do whatever they want. The problem is we live in a generation where many men have just laid down and they've, they've let the devil come in through the television programming. It is programming your mind to be like them. It's dangerous. Satan wants to send a whole generation of, of men to war right now. They want to send all the dads off to go fight some other war. And listen, there's a lot of young men right now that are growing up. They don't know what masculinity is. They don't know what manhood is. They're not taught how to work with their hands. And, and listen, I, I know that being a man is much more than knowing how to change a tire or a chainsaw blade or using a wrench and the difference between a pipe wrench and a spanner or whatever. I, I know that it's so much more than that. And those are not as important as spiritual things. But we do live in a time, generally speaking, the men are very weak. Their mind is being used as they uh, thumb wrestle a piece of plastic and they stare at a screen and, and they think that they're being men because they play violent games of shoot 'em up, right? And they're like, yeah, I got you. I'm better than you. I'm smarter than you. I'm quicker than you with my thumbs. And then all of a sudden, here comes the draft. And you know what they're going to say? Well, I can do that because I've done it for years. Hey, maybe I can go flying drones. And then they join. And next thing you know, they're in a trench with a rifle in the mud with people that they're philosophically opposed to, and they don't have the spiritual stamina to do the right thing. Manhood is under attack in America, and there are many young men that are obsessed with video games, and it is stealing their mind, it is stealing their heart, it is stealing their souls. There are young men that have reported to me other things like, it's not just the games, it's the conversation that goes on within those games and the things that's shared and the, the content outside of the game that really begins to affect you. It's a whole community. I believe the devil knows, hey, kill dad, and you can convert the children into commies. That's where they want to go. They want your children to be communists, to be able to turn you in. Jesus even warned about it in the Olivet Discourse that, that, that brothers and sisters and children will be turning in the parents and the families will be turning on one another. I really believe this, year, this plan has been going on for about 100 years in communism and socialism and like tentacles of an octopus, it's going around the world and it's found its way to the heart of America and it's in all of our politics it's in all of our music. It's in all of our social conversations. How we say, what we say people are. It's in our public schools. 
So how, how does mainstream Satanism, and this, this mainstream Satanic concept through the news and everything, how does it attack men? Who's heard the word toxic masculinity? Toxic masculinity, right? Now, what happens is there may be uh, some bad example of a man and they uh, make a meme out of him, they make a little video out of him and they say, see, this is a toxic male, you know? This is what happens when men are masculine, right? And of course, social media wants to drag every man through the mud uh, as if being manly is somehow dangerous, right? I mean, that's the underlying agenda. And look, I get it. We're all sinners. And believe me, I know there are some bad men and bad examples of dads and horrible examples of fathers. I get that. And just as much as there are some bad women that are horrible examples of women, and so the people are bad, okay? We know that. But what they want to do is dial in and focus on one issue or person and then say, see, this is the Christian family. There's been many names in the news where uh, somebody messed up or somebody did something wrong and they just, they blow it up and everybody looks and they say, look, see, that's Christianity for you. It's our job to understand God's role for men. I understand that evil is very prevalent in society. I get that. We're not ignorant to that. But to call a manly man toxic is really Satan's attack on God's vision for manhood. It's part of the agenda to blur the lines of gender. And I think a lot of times when we think masculine, we think of you know, some big old muscled out rippled guy that you can't even see, he can't move his neck because he's so, he put, pumps weights all the time. Look. I, that's a whole nother conversation. There are some masculine men that look like that. Most do not. You know, having power, truly having power, is being able to constrain and to control your power. Uh, those that are, you know, uh, keen, uh, that are skilled in self-defense, um, there's guys I've met, they could walk through a crowd and no one could touch them. They're that skilled. But you wouldn't know it. They didn't go around popping off at the mouth saying, I can beat up anybody right? Uh, using the power that God has given you in a righteous way and is, a, is an essential part of biblical manhood. There's been this agenda to blur the lines, right? What do they want the men to look like today? Soft, tender, wearing pink, skinny jeans, right? Isn't that, isn't that what's happening? They want the men to be effeminate, which is a sin according to the Bible, and they want the women to be butch and leading the show, which goes against the Bible. Blurring the genders, this has always been the agenda. I want you to understand, there is a spiritual system of Babylon. We talked about it in Sunday school and even a little in uh, the Sunday morning service, that there, was, there is a heavenly Jerusalem, right? There's two systems. There's the Babylonian system, right? And the mystery Babylon, that system has been around since Babel. It's not just a city or a culture or a religion. It's a mentality that the devil uses to attack. If you remember Daniel in the lion's den, right? Daniel, as he and his friends were brought in, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, they're given these new names. And as Daniel was brought in, uh, he went to the prince of the eunuchs and he told them, he said, wait, I'm not going to touch the unclean meat. I'm not going to touch the wine. Uh, prove me. Let me prove it to you. And it ended up after that, they found him, it said, 10 times better. Daniel is an interesting case study because we're not told anything about his parents, but what we do know is that they trained him up to be a godly man. As soon as he got in the Babylonian system, do you know what they did to him? They turned him into a eunuch. The blurring of the lines of gender have always been the agenda with this Babylonian satanic system. They want to blur the lines of what a man is and what a woman is. And, uh, you know, oh, there's a surgery for that. And you can make up your own word and call it your very own gender if, if you want. I mean, we live in a strange time, but it's nothing new under the sun. That's what they've been doing for thousands of years to the children. They want to uh, demasculate them and they want them to be weak. And they want them to act like women. 
Well, God doesn't want us. God wants us men to be godly men. Men, it's your job to be manly. And again, I'm not talking about how many push-ups you can do. Okay? I'm not. Ladies, women, God wants you to be feminine. He wants you to embrace how He made you. Embrace exactly who God made you to be. Now, here's the problem. is The Bible warns us about those that are lovers of their own selves. We have a scientific term for that now. It's called narcissism. Right? Now, there are some toxic men out there. And yeah, they're bad examples of role models. They are narcissistic. They want to put up a camera and watch, look at me at the gym, right? And women do the same thing, but we're talking about men tonight. So ladies, you're off the hook, right? <laughs> Although it applies, right? So narciss oh, look at me. I love myself and let me show off and let, let everybody give me some praise and look what I can do. You're in Psalm chapter 12. If you would, look at verse number 1. Psalm chapter 12, verse number 1. Help, Lord, for the godly man ceaseth. Look at that. The godly man ceaseth. This is a time when finding a spiritual man is hard to find. Biblical masculinity was difficult. He said, for the godly man ceaseth, for the faithful fail from among the children of men. The problem is men are no longer faithful today. They're no longer living godly. They're living for themselves. They want their own priority, their own agenda, their own pleasure. They put that above everything else. And yeah, that's a horrible example of a man. That's not the kind of manhood that God made you for. That's just selfishness and greediness and covetousness. Look at the next verse, verse 2. They speak vanity... Every one with his neighbor, with flattering lips and with a double heart, do they speak. It's interesting. They're speaking vanity. You know what vanity is? Mindless fluff. Right? Let me give you my own definition. Mindless fluff. It's selfish, prideful, hollow, empty, pointless. A.K.A. football. Uh-oh. Now, now I'm really stepping on you. I'm talking, yeah, yeah, I said it. Football means absolutely nothing in eternal value. And you go and talk to your neighbor, and it's like, how about them Braves? You hear old so-and-so's got a, this kind of thing, and he did that, and he's got this. And you, well, you know he came to here, and he went to school over there. And it's like they know all this stuff about nothing. That's right. Now, we have a natural tendency to be tribal. This is kind of a tribe, our little church here. We're a tribe. And when the men get together, we talk about certain things. And a lot of the times it's about the Bible. And then usually it's about some other stuff and our biblical perspective of what's going on in the world and relating to each other and families and all these things. And we are a little tribe. And we have a tendency to keep information. And uh, I mean, I have a hard time remembering my kids' names, let alone your kids' names. And some of y'all have like eight kids. But, but this, we're good at keeping stats and it's relevant information. And if I were, you know, stranded in the woods for 30 days, there's a couple guys in here. I would want them with me because, boy, they know. They're like, uh-uh, not that plant. And hold on, use this plant like this. And I'll show you how to start a fire. And like, oh, that's good information, right? Uh, we're good. We're naturally good at keeping information and working as a team. And so Satan has used a distraction of baseball and basketball and football and hockey and fill in the blank so that we put all of our affection on on worldly things that are just a distraction from what we're really here for. It's called vanity. Absol I mean, be honest, guys. Is there any reward in heaven for being at that game where they won? Is there any reward in heaven for remembering the stats of the guy that won the game? Look at the next verse, verse 3. The Lord shall cut off all flattering lips and the tongue that speaketh proud things. Man, it's our job to be humble, not proud of vanity. If you would go to 2 Timothy chapter 3. I really believe that it is time for American men to be godly men. Not talking about sports and politics. Focused on building up 
and training up the next generation, not tearing them down, teach them the Bible, do it God's way. And when you do things God's way, you always get true joy. There's always a blessing for doing it God's way. One of the verses we read very often in the church is Deuteronomy 6, verse 7. It says, And thou shalt teach them diligently unto thy children, and shalt talk of them when thou sittest in thy house, and when thou walkest by the way, and when thou liest down, and when thou risest up. What's interesting here, this is written to dad, and he says the law of the Lord, you're going to talk to your children about the law of the Lord. Dad, you're going to control the schedule. You're going to set the pace. You're going to set the rhythm for the whole family. And you're supposed to do it when you sit in your house, when you walk by the way, that's outside of your house. When you lie down, that's bedtime. And when you rise up, that's morning time. He's kind of saying there's no time that talking about the Bible to your children is out of season. Most adults don't have a godly relationship with their parent, and, and, you know, with their children. They're not able to have that dialogue of spiritual things. And this is biblical manhood. But the problem is, and here's the reason, men need to put in the work to be a godly dad, to be a godly man. I understand not everybody in here is a dad. Some may be uh, leaders at work, and this would apply to you. It applies to you. Some of you are young ladies that are not yet married. This applies to you. This is what you're looking for in a godly man. Don't let the world convince you that a masculine man is toxic. Uh, we're going to talk about what that looks like. Let's avoid a worldly man and let's be godly biblical men. I'm talking about biblical masculinity. You're in 2 Timothy chapter 3. If you would, look at verse number 1. 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse number 1. This know also that in the last days perilous times shall come. For men shall be lovers of their own selves. There it is, narcissism. My way or the highway. You, I'm number one around here. I'm the one that's in charge. Look, he says, covetous. That's always desiring something that doesn't belong to you. Boasters. Who's ever worked around a boaster? You know what I'm a guy that's like popping off at the mouth, always telling you, hey, I can do it better than anybody else. I know more than anybody else. Usually they're the one. Okay, fine, you do it. Well, well I, uh, well, <laughs> yeah, yeah. We'll see how you are when we put you to the test, right? Boasters. He says, proud. He says, uh, blasphemers, disobedient to parents, unthankful, unholy. You notice that part about being disobedient to parents? It's all in the training. It's all in the training. We need to teach the next generation. We need to lead by good godly example. This is our job. What's a biblical man look like? Well, he's one that's teaching obedience. Hey, children, watch me as I obey God. And then you follow suit, and you obey me, and you obey God. That's the way that it ought to be. Look, he says in verse 3, Without natural affection, truce breakers, false accusers, incontinent, fierce, despisers of those that are good, traitors, heady, all right, they can't keep their word, heady, that means they're so puffed up, it doesn't take long we could go through a name of famous people, and you, you would see that heady, they're, they're just so full of themselves. They surround themselves with yes men, so they, tell me how great I am. What was it, there's a joke, it says, uh, what did the narcissist say? Um, he said, I'm tired of talking about myself. Why don't you talk about me for a little while? You know? <laughs> I mean, this is the world we live in. Everybody's way up here, and they want to they think they're better than everybody else. Uh, but look at this in verse 4. He says, heady, high-minded, lovers of pleasure more than lovers of God. And, and there's the root of the problem. Men love darkness rather than light because their deeds were evil. Well, I don't want to start looking for God because that means I have to change all of my habits and my preferences and I might have to serve somebody else instead of serving myself. And I'm really enjoying the pleasure I've got going on. i got it figured out. Most men in this world, they're only living for themselves. They're living for pleasure. They're living in the moment. And listen, I'm going to tell you, they are not happy. 
They're not satisfied. They don't have true joy. They are missing out and they know it. They feel like, man, I want, they're just always searching for something else and they'll never accomplish it if they don't do it God's way. He says in verse 5, having a form of godliness, but denying the power thereof. From such, turn away. You know, there's religious ones. Um, what's that, uh, Andrew Tate? Or even Jordan Peterson, to a certain extent, there are men that are lifted up as like, well, this guy's wise, and he knows some stuff about manliness. But then it's like, yeah, but if they're denying the Lord Jesus Christ, and they're going to do it in their own earthly, worldly wisdom, and they're really missing out on what it's all about. I really believe that, you know, anybody that comes up with anything great, so it's probably based on the Bible some way, somehow, or they're copying uh, some Christian from time past that wrote something down that was kind of brilliant that God gave them. They're like, ooh, I'll borrow from that, and it sounds great, and people eat it up because they're thirsty and hungry for wisdom. But look, this type of person, this is that narcissist. Look at verse 6. For of this sort are they which creep into houses... In other words, it's not their house. And lead captive silly women laden with sins, led away with diverse lusts. This is a pretty strong verse. It's almost like he's talking about a guy that's seducing single moms. Or somebody that they go after these silly women that are full of lust. All they can do is lust and lust and lust and lust and lust. And they know how to manipulate them. And they lead them captive. It's like they walk in with an invisible rope and tighten it around their neck. And they follow them wherever they want to go. This is the narcissistic man. Uh, yeah, that's very toxic. That's very destructive. That's not godly at all. That's not true power. In fact, they're given to their own covetousness. It's a weakness. Look at verse 7. Ever learning and never able to come to the knowledge of the truth. They're searching, they're wandering, but they're not built on the solid rock of Christ so they know that they're missing out. If you would, go to 1 Corinthians 16. 1 Corinthians 16. Brother Ross, and um, boy, we do miss him this week as they've been gone. In one of his sermons a while back about the family, I'll never forget it, he's talking about the divorce rate and that when you get divorced, that the abuse rate of children, when, when a couple splits up, mom has the children, the children are at a high risk of abuse. I believe the stats were something like 40% likely to be abused one way or another by the next person that comes in the house. Uh, if they get divorced a second time, it goes up to like 60%. And then after that, it's like 85%. And what, what's happening is when somebody splits up from mom and dad, right? When mom and dad split up and the children are in a mixed home, or they're back and forth. When that child is in another home, you don't know who's over there or who they are. There are people that prey on single moms because she's weak, she's not a shepherd, and they want to devour the little ones, and they know that if they go over there and mom mom really just trust him and he's a good guy don't you know oh will you mind watching the kids sure I'll take care of the kids they love me and they're at a high risk of abuse because mom lets any old Joe come by this is a serious statistic and it ought to scare you to death and divorce itself ought to scare you to the point of like, man, I'm scared to death for my children. I'll do it. I'll fight to not have a divorce. Do whatever I have to do to protect the children. We have to do avoid divorce at all costs. And men, it comes back to you. We have to fight adultery, covetousness, lust, fornication. We have to avoid ungodliness. If we give in to that temptation, we let the wrong person in our life, that's how Satan can smite the shepherd, is by putting the wrong woman in the right place at the wrong time, and then you're the victim, if you will. And guess who suffers? Your children. It's a sad truth. Proverbs 4, he says, Keep thy heart with all diligence, for out of it are the issues of life. 
what you allow in your heart, what you trust, who's in your inner sphere, who you let in your space, you better be very, very careful who you let in your space. I mean, 1 Corinthians 7 actually tells you it's good that a man not touch a woman, but to avoid fornication, let him have his own wife. What that's saying is, men, don't touch another woman, even if it's just right here. And if a woman comes up and touches you here, you say, oh, hey, I'm a married man. Uh, let me give you a hug. Nope, that's okay. You know, you practice your uh, karate kid moves. You know, you just kind of move to the side and get out of the way, right? If you're you're married men, you don't let anybody in your space or touch you. You don't let anybody get close to your heart and become familiar with you and just get around you on a regular basis. You have to fight to keep your distance for the sake of your children. Lamentations 3 says, Mine eye affecteth mine heart because of the daughters of the city. Men, you know what that means? Think about it. My eye, what I look at, affects my heart because of how the daughters of the land are. This is a serious risk. We live in a time where people are training up their children to dress like harlots in public, to go out in their underwear. I mean, this is a, this is a bizarre time. It really is. Dad, be man enough to protect your family. Amen. Biblical masculinity sacrifice whatever it takes to protect the next generation die to yourself live for christ in genesis 34 we see dinah she was the daughter of jacob it says that she went out to see the daughters of the land this is a hard one dad you need to draw a line somewhere with your children and say no Hey, Dad, we're, oh, we're just going to go over here and have a sleepover. No. Hey, Dad, I'm going shopping. It's just going to be me and my friends and my mom. And I know they don't come to church, but it's okay. You say, no. Dinah went out to see the daughters of the land. What is she looking at? Decorating ideas? The latest fashion? She went looking at the daughters. In the next verse, it says that Shechem, the prince of the land, looked at her and took her and lay with her and defiled her. She's alone in a strange city without a shepherd there to protect her. This is a hard truth. We live in a generation. Uh, this is why we open up certain doors and we close other doors and I want things open and wide and transparent because God forbid that on our watch a kid gets hurt in this church. This is why we really do focus on family integration because rather than we're going to send out a bus and pick up strangers that have been watching TV and filthy jokes all week and bring them in and send them down to your children that have been reading the Bible all week and let them tell their dirty jokes in front of your children, I would rather say, Dad, get saved, get your family in the church, get the Bible in your heart, and start teaching your family how to live for God. I would rather see the shepherd get on board with God's program and have some biblical masculinity instead of like, well, we'll borrow your kids for an hour. We'll entertain them and throw candy at them and we'll bring them back. Look, and I know, I, I, went, I went on bus routes with my dad when he was a kid. Some of my earliest memories going out soul winning and running buses. And I, I, I think we're in a different time. Did anybody lock their door last night? Yeah, amen! Now, now, how many of you have heard somebody say, well, I remember back in the day, we didn't even bother locking the door. Right. Amen. Yeah, she did. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, it's a common thing. It used to be where it's like I knew the neighbors. I was over at these folks over here. I was visiting with them, and the neighbor just comes walking in. And I'm like, you hear it? I'm like, do we need to like do something? Is everything going to be okay? No, I'm just kidding. I wasn't. But I'm like, okay. And Oh, that's the neighbor. He comes over all the time. Well, they know each other. They have a good relationship. They leave their doors open. They invite each other in. Uh, that's the way things used to be when society was based on the biblical foundation. Right? Well, we don't have that anymore. We've lost that. Communism has taken over. If the foundations be destroyed, what shall the righteous do? The, I mean, if your house has a roof leak and a big crack down the wall and the windows are cracked and you see the crack going all the way through the floor and it's sunken down... You're like, huh, we've got a foundation problem. Maybe we should call the roofers. Would that be wise? No. That's as good as putting a piece of duct tape over the engine warning light. 
No, deal with the problem. It's the foundation. We've gotten away from Christ. We're not obeying Him. We're not putting His Word in our heart. We're not living what we see. We're not living by example. And I say the buck stops with the buck. Dad, it's your fault. Men, you can fix it. Even you men that are single that don't have a family, I really believe God can use you at such a time as this to teach the younger men, to teach those that you interact with that God has a plan, He has a way, and if you'll stick to it or get back to it, it'll change your life. It'll give you true joy. You're in 1 Corinthians 16. Let's take a look at this real quick. Look at verse number 13. I want to show you God's plan for biblical masculinity. Verse 13, he says, Watch ye, stand fast in the faith, quit you like men, be strong. Very short verse, but he says a really couple neat things in here. When he says, quit you like men, I know in our mind we say quit, like stop. That's not what he's saying. The older word, it actually means acquit. Acquit is a legal term. Uh, it would mean to be free of a criminal charge, typically. I've been acquitted. I wasn't found guilty. That word quit as acquit also has another definition to conduct oneself or perform in a specified way. What he is actually saying here when he says quit you like men, he's saying act like men. Right Now he's writing to the church. They're already saved. He's instructing them. This is his, he's closing the letter down in this letter. He's landing the plane. He's like, a few things for the men. Let me just remind you of this. Act like men. Now that's to say, don't act like women. Amen? And, and that's to say, uh, don't act like animals either. It's also to say, let's not act like children. Let's put away childish things. He says, act like men, be a man, show yourself a man. And you know, guys, this takes hard work. And I really believe God's given you the gusto you need to be able to do it. He's given you the Holy Spirit to, to just drive right on through and do the hard work. He, I mean, we shouldn't be armchair quarterbacks. Somebody says, do you like football? You know what my answer is? Yeah, let's go throw one. Right? If you want to, okay, come sit down and watch the, now I'm not interested. I'd rather go sit in a room by myself and read the Bible and get close to God. But now if we're having fellowship time, let's go throw a football and we'll have a good time doing that too. I'm not the best at it, but I'll give it a try. Act like men. Be men is what he's saying. A conduct thyself as a man. Notice he also says in this statement that we should uh, men should be vigilant. Look at the first part of that verse. He says, watch ye. Watch ye. Masculine men should watch over their own hearts and keep it with diligence. Masculine men should watch over their family and stand guard. I mean, as men, we're commanded to lay our life down as Christ did for us. We're commanded to lay our life down for our family. And if I took a poll, every man in here would probably say, I would jump in front of a bullet for somebody, right? But that's part of it, but that's not all, not all he's talking about. He's talking about, don't just let them serve you. You find ways to serve them. He says, watch ye. That means looking around. We, we, we go out shopping with the family. We go somewhere to eat. I'm just like, do, 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 do. You're like, where are you at? I'm just, I'm just paying attention to who's coming in and what they're doing. Those people are on drugs right now. They're high off their gourd. They're sitting over there, and I think that guy's got a gun. And, and you know, I, mean, I just started, she's like, where do you, where'd you see all that? And I'm just paying attention. I'm being circumspect. I'm looking all the way around. I want to know what's going on in the room so nothing takes me by surprise, right? Well, we would do the same at our house, especially if there were wolves outside the door. Well, spiritually speaking, there are. And they're after the little ones. So let's watch. Let's watch. God has given us souls that He's entrusted into us, men. We need to be leaders over them and teach them. We're supposed to be protectors and providers. To watch ye means we're to be leaders. Notice He also says there, He says, watch ye, stand fast in the faith. Stand fast in the faith. This implies scriptural conviction. This means you know your doctrine. Then he says at the end of it, be strong. He says, quit you like men, be strong. Again, we're not just talking about how many push-ups you can do. 
being strong, godly men are to be strong spiritually and emotionally and mentally. Some men just don't want to learn anything new. I'm good. I don't need to know anything. Other guys, they're like, oh, cool. Yeah, I want to learn something new. Let me grab a new skill or figure something out. I'd love to. That's great. Maybe I can use it one day. Right? And this applies to all of us, certain aspects of this. We need to be strong spiritually as the leader. We need to be strong emotionally. Right? Uh, <laughs> you shouldn't go home and cry on your wife's shoulder every night. Just, you know, I mean, come on, you know. <laughs> come out and fight like a man. <laughs> Crying under the bed, you know. God's will is that men would be spiritually, mentally, emotionally strong and be leaders in that area. Being strong in the Lord and in the power of His might. This is God's will, to put on the whole armor. Look at the next verse. He says in verse 14, 1 Corinthians 16, verse 14, Let all your things be done with charity. Men. He says, act like a man. Do some stuff with charity. This is biblical masculinity, which is not toxic at all. He's telling you to show some love for somebody else, to actually care for them. What's he say in 1 Corinthians 13? Listen, he says, Charity suffereth long and is kind. Charity envieth not. Charity vaunteth not itself, is not puffed up, doth not behave itself unseemly, seeketh not her own, is not easily provoked, thinketh no evil, rejoiceth not in iniquity, but rejoiceth in the truth, beareth all things, believeth all things, hopeth all things, endureth all things. When he says, men, be strong and have some charity in everything that you do, I mean, sometimes we just need a little more patience with those that we're dealing with. Sometimes we just need to put on our big boy britches and say, hey, hey, listen, the buck stops here. I love you, and that's why we have a rule. This is the rule because Daddy said so. That's how we're going to do it, and you stick to your guns. You don't let them train you by crying. Hey, can you do this? Ah, oh, they're crying. Just give them what they want. They've trained you. You're supposed to train them by standing your ground, showing them how to be a man and doing it in charity. Biblical masculinity is a blessing. It is a blessing. If you will, look at verse 15. 1 Corinthians 16, verse number 15. I beseech you, brethren, you know the house of Stephanus, that it is the firstfruits of Achai, in other words, the first one saved there, and that they have addicted themselves to the ministry of the saints. It has to be said, because if I went around and asked most guys, they would probably confess, whether public or private, yeah, I kind of have an addictive personality. And I would say, that's not just your personality, that's the old man, that's the flesh. Your flesh is very addictive. God wants you to be addicted to ministering that's helping or serving, ministering to the saints. Those are people that believe on Jesus. God wants us to serve others. He wants you to be addicted to serving others, to be focused and dialed in and desiring for more opportunities to serve others. The problem is uh, we get in a church and it's like, well, I mean, I'm okay with those folks and I don't like them and I'm over here. And it's like, no, no, why don't you go serve them? Why don't you pray for them? Why don't you help them? Why don't you encourage them? And don't hold a grudge with people. It's God's will that we would grow up as Christians and start being more loving and charitable to those, especially in the brothers and sisters in our house. Being kind and compassionate. Not begrudging each other. Praying for one another. He says, addicted themselves to the ministry of the saints. I mean, it has to be said, that's instead of being addicted to video games or football, stock market, fill in the blank, gambling, internet images, being addicted to, to God and His people. Making that your priority. Making that number one. We are to be hard workers. Listen, men, we are to be hard workers. But don't be so addicted to work and gaining money that you reject your family. That you put off being the shepherd that God has called you to be. I'm thankful for the work situation I have. I work a full-time job. I work a full-time job here as well. 
there's been discussion at work. We're going to need somebody to start working on Saturdays. I'm like, I can't do it. If I work on a Saturday, that means I can't go soul winning. That means I don't have any family time. I don't have a pre church preparation time. It's like, I w literally, I have to find another job. If you ask me to work on Saturdays, I have to find another job. And I'm, I'm not excited about that, but I have to stand my ground. I'm not going to budge on the priorities that matter. Family and church. I'm addicted to serving others for Christ's sake. If you would go to Proverbs 15. We are to be hard workers, but not addicted to work itself. I just ask you in your own heart, men. What are you addicted to? Is it to serving God or living for your own pleasure? If it is for serving others and serving God, then congratulations, you're the minority. <laughs> you're, you're the underdog. But that's okay. With God, all things are possible. We can do more with a little when God than we can with a lot in our own wisdom. In Proverbs 15, I wanted to share some of this with you earlier, but I think it's pertinent that it, it ties in with the sermon about what a man ought to do. In Proverbs 15, Look at verse number one. Guys, this is for us. He says, A soft answer turneth away wrath, but grievous words stir up anger. Do you realize, and I talked about this this morning as we talked about warfare, that there's more power in your words. I believe that through the right words and the right prayer, we can stop World War III. Instead, it's grievous words that stir up anger. Verse 2, the tongue of the wise useth knowledge aright. Men, you're to learn knowledge and then know how to use it. Know how to share it. Know how to instruct others. Know how to guide them with your words. He says, but the mouth of fools poureth out foolishness. We all know guys like that. Boy, everything they talk about, it's just silly, stupid, foolish, pointless, folly, vanity. Verse 3, the eyes of the Lord are in every place, beholding the evil and the good. A wholesome tongue is a tree of life, but perverseness therein is a breach in the spirit. Guys, your, your tongue should not be telling jokes that are inappropriate. God's right there. He sees you. He hears it. And if He's not pleased with it, just simply don't say it. Instead, your tongue should be wholesome. It should be a tree of life. You should be speaking life into people, not death not foolishness, not corruption. Look at verse number 16. Proverbs 15, verse 16. Better is little with the fear of the Lord than great treasure and trouble therewith. It's better to have God on your side, and if that means you only own a little or have a little bit of money, I'd rather have God on my side and His blessing on my family than to have tons of treasure and a bunch of trouble. He says in the next couple verses, look, better is a dinner of herbs where love is than a stalled ox and hatred therewith. You say, what's for dinner? Uh, just a tiny little salad. It's a dinner of herbs. Well, that's okay, baby. I got you and I love you. Versus, what's for dinner? We slaughtered the ox. We've got steaks and we've got the fat. And we've got ground bait. And we, you know, we got all the meat you could want. But there's just bitterness and anger. I'm like, man, that's no fun. He says in verse 18, A wrathful man stirreth up strife, but he that is slow to anger appeaseth strife. Guys, we've got to keep our anger in check. It is a weapon that can destroy. There is such a thing as righteous indignation, and there are things that God gets angry at. We saw it this morning as we, when I read about how Jesus was angry at the scribes because he said, Is it lawful to do good on the Sabbath? To save life? And they wouldn't even answer him. And he got angry at them. He was furious at them. Because they know that's right. There's a time to be angry, but it's not all the time. It, it ought not to be that you fly off the handle all the time and you can't control your anger. You get mad over the littlest things. And, and you know how it goes, guys. It's like you walk in and you're like, what in the world? Who put this in? Oh, that was mine. You know, it's like you're looking to blame something everywhere you go. And it's like, why would my wife put that there? And it's like, well, it's probably my fault. You know, that, little, that still small voice comes to you as you're conscious. Like, hey, buddy, don't blame her. She's here to help you. Verse 19. The way of the slothful man is as an hedge of thorns, but the way of righteousness is made plain. 
the plain path, you can see where you're going. The, the hedge of horns, thorns, it's slowly building up this dangerous thing that makes it impassable. It'll, it'll cut you. Uh, look at verse 21. We're almost done. Look at this, guys. Two more. Verse 21. Folly is joy to him that is destitute of wisdom. So if you don't have godly wisdom, you love foolishness. It makes you happy, right? Folly is joy to him that is destitute of wisdom, but a man of understanding walketh uprightly. There's the goal. Walk upright. And I'm not just talking about good posture. We're talking about your spiritual posture. Walking for the Lord in the fear of the Lord, on the path of the Lord, for the Lord all of your life. Look at verse 24. The way of life is above to the wise that he may depart from hell beneath. Some men are on the wrong path. Guys, I, I want to help you see this vision for biblical masculinity. And I tell you, if Satan can strike dad and get him out of the house, oh, he will devour the children. It's a statistical fact. If dad could uh, be tempted by Satan to fall out, if dad could be sent to war by Satan to not be around, then he can turn the hearts of the children away from the Father. That was the curse at the end of the Old Testament. And that was the promise that John the Baptist would turn the hearts back to the fathers and begin to restore that. And he did. And then, of course, Jesus came along. Guys, I just tell you, if you could just see your earthly purpose. You have a spiritual ministry. You have a earthly purpose here and now but we're distracted by the vanity of the world. If you would just understand, men, that we're here to be a good, godly example. You young men that are growing up now, you have a purpose in life. It's to show everyone around you that you know what God said and you're willing to do it and just be that kind of man. It's not about your push-ups. It's not about your job title. It's not about your bank account. It's your spiritual integrity to stand and walk upright for God. If you'll get a hold of that and say, I have a plan and I'm going to follow God's plan. He has a purpose for me and I want to see His vision. I want to get in the Word of God for myself and I want to find it. You will discover it. The next generation can be a spiritual success. Guys, I warn you, after speaking to several people this week about death and those that they've recently lost. I just want to compel you, don't leave a casket full of regrets. Leave some spiritual success for the next generation. Do the hard thing. Teach them now. Love them now. Guide their hearts now toward Christ. Men, will you live for God now while there's time? Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, I thank You for Your Word. Lord, I pray that You would continue to help the men in this church to grow. Lord, I pray that You would help us to lead the young men in this church to follow You. Lord, I pray that You would help us to do all things with charity. Lord, I pray that You would help us to not give in to the wiles of the devil. He wants to destroy the family. Lord, I ask You would put a hedge of protection around the families here. Help the men to have biblical masculinity and honor You in all that they do. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen.